Protein digestibility is measured by the Digestible Indispensable Amino Acid Score, or the DIAAS. The protein that you're actually digesting is not always used by the body, nor does it always contribute to the net nitrogen balance in the body. Now, another thing that this group is challenging is the RDA and PRI of protein, 0.8 grams per kilogram, which is not a lot. They say that protein requirements are set at minimal need to prevent net nitrogen losses, but arguably are not sufficient to account for all factors contributing to quality of life throughout the lifespan. What's up you guys, Dr. Jacob Gooden here, professor of kinesiology and sports science at Point Loma Nazarene University. Now today for our first research review, we are covering the topic of protein and particularly from this review called Dietary Protein Quantity quality and exercise are key to healthy living. Now, what caught my eye from this article was this muscle-centric perspective. I was curious to see what Bird and colleagues had to say about maximizing well-being across the lifespan and how they were gonna do that with a muscle-centric approach. Now, this comes from the University of Illinois. That's where the research group is based out of. And now, a couple things about this study. First of all, it is a narrative review. So the researchers are not doing any type of actual data collection themselves they are breaking down the current state of the literature and they're taking a specific narrative approach to that literature and really telling us what are some of the remaining questions to be answered, what do we know now, and what are some conclusions that we can take from the overwhelming body of literature. Now in particular, this group is challenging and making some recommendations to a few staples in how we understand protein. The first is the pro protein digestibility score. Protein digestibility is measured by the Digestible Indispensable Amino Acid Score, or the DIAAS. And the way that researchers measure this is actually on a pig model. It's difficult to do in humans. And in this pig growth model, they look at um, how, what percentage of the essential amino acids are digested in the ileum of the small intestine. And this is important because it is a better way of really categorizing the digestibility of protein over the previous method, which was called the PDCAAS, or the Protein Digestibility Corrected Amino Acid Score, for a couple reasons. One is because um, the new score limits protein, um, protein quality to one. It sort of caps it at one. It doesn't go over that, so it's easier to understand. And also because of the point in the body, in the small intestines, in the ileum to be exact, where they're measuring it from, um, it gives us uh, maybe a less inflated view of the digestibility and the quality of these proteins. Now the researchers bring up a possible issue with this, and that is that uh, protein, muscle protein synthesis rates and actual use in the body and the oxidation versus the um, anabolic use of these proteins uh, can be in flux, and that's dependent upon several factors. And so the protein that you're actually digesting is not always used by the body, nor does it always contribute to the net um, nitrogen balance in the body. And therefore they suggest several things. In fact, the researchers say this, it is perhaps important to consider coupling protein digestibility scoring methods with direct measurements of protein synthesis rates, for example, within the skeletal muscle, and whole body amino acid oxidation rates. They go on to say that this would actually confirm that ingested protein foods are stimulating postprandial, that means after consumption of a meal, postprandial muscle protein synthesis rates without excessive amino acid oxidation rates. Um, and that provides confirmation that the available dietary amino acids in circulation are actually being used to support vital tissues. So what does all this mean? This means that when you digest protein, even if it's of a high DIAAS score, it's not always making its way to the actual vital tissues, uh, in particular the muscle, which is the sink and the storage site for your amino acids. And so we need to start to couple and correlate um, different proteins and cooking methods and, uh, and uh, food combinations at a holistic level so that we can start to trace these actual protein synthesis outcomes. Now, another thing that this group is challenging is the RDA and PRI of protein. Now, the RDA, Recommended Dietary Allowance, was established um, in the U.S. by the Food and Nutrition Board of the National Academies Institute of Medicine. And the recommended allotment of protein for adults per day is 0.8 grams per kilogram, which is not a lot. So even for a 100 kilogram person, I'm doing simple math on camera, that's only 80 grams of protein per day, right? And that's for a fairly large individual, 225 pounds, 220 pounds. And um, this protein amount is set 
so that 96 to 97 percent of individuals will not be deficient in protein okay it's not meant to keep you performing optimally it's not meant to meet your goals of maximizing success in sport or maximizing muscular development or even of staving off the muscle loss with age that we will all undergo that sarcopenia that you will start to encounter as you go through the middle stages of life and likewise the pri which stands for population reference intakes in Europe has um, an amount of 0.83 grams per kilogram of body weight. So very similar between the US and Europe. And these researchers make the case that these are too low. They say that protein requirements are set at minimal need to prevent net nitrogen losses, but arguably are not sufficient to account for all factors contributing to quality of life throughout the lifespan. So exercise habits, which we know that exercise is the best medicine to fight against all types of preventable diseases, as well as to continue quality of life with age, exercise habits, aging, hospitalization, disease, etc. Now, the researchers also point out that the USDA's choose my plate ounce equivalence approach to uh, protein recommendations may not always be correct. And you could have a wide variation in the actual amount of amino acids that you're consuming based on the quality of protein that you're consuming. So ounce equivalents are not always your best bet when it comes to making sure that you're hitting certain protein totals. Now, one of the tables included in this study um, was titled Cooking Method and its Impact on Protein Quality Scores. And I found this particularly fascinating because I've always known that different types of cooking methods actually increase or decrease the digestibility of proteins. I had no idea by how much it could impact that. I took a look at the DIAAS of beef, and in particular, beef is interesting because when it's raw, it has a score of 97. If you boil the beef, it goes up to 99, but if you bake or grill it, it actually goes down to 80. It loses almost 20% of its digestibility score, depending on the method that you cook it. And I'm sure if you overcook it, let's say on the grill, if you have those burgers on the grill, I grilled up some burgers last night, and maybe they're char burgers with some char around the edge. You know, you're extruding a lot of the fat by pressing it down, and it's on there for a while because you want to make sure it's healthy, right? Uh, or that it doesn't make you sick at the very least. Well, that score is going to be very low. We're going to get a lot fewer amino acids per gram or per pound of meat than if it was raw. Now, I'm not advocating you go all, you know, ancestral tenant and <laughs> consume raw meat, but it is important to be aware of this. So the authors actually recommend what they call a food first approach. This is a more holistic approach that takes into account the fact that most people are not um, weighing and partitioning their food. They're not going to be scouring the nutrition labels or using an app such as Evolve AI, an app which tracks your nutrition and also gives you strength training. They're not gonna be using things like that for every single meal. Most people take a whole food approach based on their culture and their upbringing and their socioeconomic status, what they have available to them. And so the authors bring that up. They say, we should take this food first approach, but then they acknowledge that, hey, this is gonna be challenging to really study the endless, almost infinite combinations of foods that you could combine and cook together. And it does this by slowing down the gastric emptying rate, which we uh, know that lipids do that uh, in humans as well. And this actually allows for more time uh, um, in that gastric emptying sequence for the proteins to be breaking down with proteolytic enzymes and it therefore increases the digestibility of the proteins in the meal that was just consumed. So takeaway from that is consume your protein with some fats uh, during your meal, which most of us do anyways if it's a whole food meal, and that will slow the digestion rate and increase the digestibility of the proteins. Now, I'm not advocating to go full keto and just eat bacon every day, which has some protein and a lot of fat, but it does mean that if you're always eating super, super lean meals, broccoli and chicken and rice, you might not be getting um, as high of a protein digestibility as you may think. Time and time again, we see the same diet model pop up. It is the infamous chicken, broccoli and rice. Sometimes not even rice, sometimes just chicken and broccoli. So don't be afraid to have a little bit of fat with your meals as well. Now, one of the other fascinating things that these researchers highlighted was the differing effects of anaerobic versus aerobic training, particularly strength training versus endurance training on muscle protein synthesis rates. And what they stressed was that following resistance training, the anabolic response is much, much greater than just the response to eating a protein-rich meal at rest versus the response of eating a protein-rich meal after aerobic exercise. For instance, they say that resistance exercise in, is inherently anabolic by improving net muscle protein balance as defined as muscle protein synthesis minus the breakdown 
for up to two days. That's a long anabolic window. And what this means in part is that resistance exercise enhances the dietary amino acid sensitivity of muscle protein synthesis such that lower protein amounts are required to elicit robust anabolic effects when compared uh, to the sedentary state. That doesn't mean eat less protein because you're going to get the same anabolic response. It means you should continue the same or greater protein intake because now we're combining it. It's a summative effect with the resistance training that you are undergoing. They highlight that you need fewer essential amino acids to get this response because that's in part how this research was conducted in a comparison to that uh, steady state uh, or that sedentary state. Which of these states post resistance training versus post sedentary required fewer essential amino acids to maximize the muscle protein synthesis response? Now compare that to endurance exercise and the researchers say endurance exercise appears to be on the other end of the spectrum in terms of its impact on dietary protein utilization. Um, they go on to say that oxidation of endogenous amino acids may only represent a fraction of total energy provision during exercise. So meaning that not very much protein is actually used for fuel or oxidized during the exercise, but their utilization increases when the intensity and the duration increases. Okay, so for example, they say that total leucine loss, remember leucine, isoleucine, and valine are known as the branch chain amino acids and have been found to be particularly stimulative in muscle protein synthesis. Um, they say that loss in a two hour endurance session can be up to about 1.5 grams, which is fairly high. That's fairly close to that, you know, quote unquote, leucine threshold that we've all heard so much about. And furthermore, even after providing athletes with a generous amount of leucine, a leucine rich meal after endurance exercise, they still found that the net leucine balance was negative. So the protein turnover for endurance athletes is very high, which leads these researchers to recommend that even endurance athletes should have a much higher protein intake than what the RDA is stating. And this is something that we've known as coaches, as sports scientists for a long time, but now we have this research group that is taking the entire body of literature, the, all of the evidence into account and saying, hey, we need to have a holistic view of protein intake, not just based on grams per kilogram, but also at what point of development are you in? Adolescent or child all the way up to adult, through middle age into um, your elder years, what type of exercise do you engage in? Is it resistance training? Is it endurance? Is it both? Are you a hybrid athlete? Are you a field sport athlete? Are you a strength athlete? And furthermore, what types of food are you eating? What is the quality of that food? But then also, what is the cultural significance of that food and the sustainability of that food? Are you somebody who believes in eating plant-based for ethical reasons or for health reasons? And how does protein digestibility impact that? And they're taking this viewpoint of looking at it from a muscle-centric approach. So how do we maximize muscle accrual during the lifespan according to the habits of exercise and training that you have currently and then sustain that in the long term? To me, what that's saying is we, when we're thinking about longevity for our athletes, for our clients, for ourselves, for our family, we want to be ascending to the highest heights that we can as far as muscle mass and strength go so that when we start descending inevitably with age, we don't fall as far. We maintain as much as we can and we start from a higher height so that as we age and as that starts to fall off inevitably with age, we're still robust enough and strong enough to accomplish our activities of daily living, to do the things that we enjoy, to have a quality of life to the end. This was just one of the many other takeaways from this paper. The authors end by saying, it is essential to keep in mind that there is adaptability for any protein recommendation throughout the life slash health stage, which accounts for health or performance goals, periods of hospitalization, or disease state. In turn, this will provide a better compass for the definition of optimal protein intakes for all ages. So here are my main takeaways from this paper. First of all, we want to consider a holistic approach when we're thinking about protein. Yes, I know a lot of us hear the one gram per pound of body mass of protein per day. And I still think that's a great recommendation in general. But generalities only cover so much ground. There's often extreme cases on one side or the other, and you could probably dial in your own protein intake even further considering uh, where you are in the developmental cycle. Are you an adolescent? Are you an adult? Are you in middle age or are you an older adult? Also considering your exercise habits. Are you an endurance athlete? Are you a strength athlete? A competitive field sport athlete? Do you do both strength and endurance training? 
depending on all of these things, as well as whether you choose to be vegan or plant-based or, or you continue to be an omnivore, which we know will affect the protein digestibility as we discussed at the beginning, all of those things will factor into how much protein you should be taking in per day, how much protein you should take in with each meal, and the types of foods that you will be getting your protein from. Personally, I think it's tedious to be reading all the nutrition labels on every single thing that I eat and tabulating my macros on the side as I'm consuming my food. And that's why I actually use an app that I've helped to develop called Evolve AI. It has built in nutrition programming where you can actually log the macronutrients and the calories from the food that you're eating, including protein recommendations. And you can actually tailor the daily protein goals to your own stage of life and to your own goals. It has that ability to optimize protein intake. You can do low protein, moderate protein, or high protein. And of course, the overall calories will adjust to your body composition goals as well. It's as simple as using the barcode scanner, scanning the QR code on the food that you're about to eat, or you can search for the food, or you can even use AI to transcribe what you say to the phone that you're eating. So if you say, I'm eating eight ounces of steak and a cup of white rice, it will program that in and you will get your macronutrient totals from that. They'll be added to your day daily total and you can track that over time. So for me, that's the simplest approach to making sure that I'm on top of things like this. Now, thanks guys for sticking around to the end of the video. I'm excited to be starting this process of cranking out more videos on a weekly basis. I want to continue to provide value to you. However you got to this channel, I do hope that you will hit the subscribe button, like this video if it was helpful to you, and stick around for more content just like this. All right, you guys, I'll catch you on the next video.